Hey, welcome back to the Board Game Closet. My name's Jimmy. I'm Tim. I'm Rod. And today we're going to be taking a look at A Touch of Evil. This is put out by Flying Frog Games. Plays maybe, what, five people? Uh, two to eight people in uh, <laughs> 60 to 120 minutes. So, um... Why? Huh? <laughs> Liars a lie. <laughs> Jason Hill. Okay. Uh, and then this game is designed by Jason Hill, so we want to make sure we say that. So <laughs> let's take a look and see what you get in the box. So this is what you get in the box with a touch of evil. Rod, do you want to talk about the component? Sure. Uh, as usual, Flying Frog does a great job with his components. I mean, for one thing, so these are your heroes right here. And they use actual people who are employees of the company. And they have a nice thick card stock, uh, including the, all the cards. I mean, there's just tons of cards. There's lair cards, town items, mysteries. Every one of them has great pictures on it. Again, the cards are nice and thick. Uh, the miniatures themselves, again, they're decent quality. The board is great. I mean, the only thing I would say with the board is, is that I think it's too small, but you know what? You really don't need a big board for this game mm -hmm. because you have all the cards and stuff, and then they, they give you a CD with the, with the music. Mm -hmm. Sounds a little bit like the zombie one, but still very, very good. Um, so all in all, I think the components are, I think I think they're fantastic. I think it, most people who purchase the Flying Frog games will notice that all the components are always good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, Tim, do you want to tell us about the rules? How complicated is it to learn? That kind of thing. Uh, yeah. So uh, here's the rule book. It's, it's actually not that thick. Um, the game is actually pretty complex um, when you get into it. They, don't, they didn't do a very good job of easing the players into the game, uh, but they did a great job of referencing everything. They have the pictures and the, and the uh, bold words and stuff so you can look it up. Uh, they do have a good reference sheet on the back and they give out uh, reference cards for all the players. Uh, but it, w it was very complex just to get in, get it everybody in, in their heads, like this is what you got to do and this is how you can do it. Um, it is actually simplistic in in the turn order because mm -hmm. you're basically you just you're doing three steps and, and that's it. And then uh, after everybody's done, the villain does his thing. Um, or the mystery phase, I guess, so the villain might not do anything. But still, it's, it's like um, the complexity of every little thing because when you're encountering something, you have to go, well, what do I do when I encounter stuff? You have to look it up and everything. And so there's a couple questions repeatedly throughout the um, throughout the game for the first game or two. So, um, at, But after that, you pretty much got it down to the, you know, the steps. And so um, it's just they didn't do a good job easing into it. You're but just in there. <laughs> the mechanics are, are pretty good, though. Pretty easy, and, yeah. And it is explained in here. So every situation you come across, you should be able to find it. Right. So in A Touch of Evil, at the beginning, each person is going to take a character card. And so that character card gives you stats. Uh, this is very typical of most games where you have a character. It tells you maybe special abilities that might, they might have, how many wounds that they can take, all of those types of things. Then you have a corresponding miniature that goes with that, which is great. I appreciate that they had those in the game. And then a turn order uh, is composed of three basic things. So the first thing that's going to happen is um, the whoever is the first player. So there's a first player token. That hero is going to go. Then everybody else gets to go. And then the mystery phase happens. And so that could be there's going to be villains that you're going to be facing in the game. And they have a card that uh, references what they can do. And then... Um, uh, then that's it. So it just repeats. And so the basic premise behind the game is you're going to be going throughout this town of Shadowbrook and you're going to be looking for things. You're going to be exploring things based on whatever the scenario is. That's what you're going to be doing. So on a turn, you, on your turn, you can do a couple things. So the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to roll to see how far you can move. So you just roll a D6 and then you see, okay, I can go two spaces. And then when you move your two spaces, wherever you end at is then where you're able to uh, do a couple things. So if there's 
an enemy in that location, you can fight that enemy, or you can explore that area. And this is where the flavor and the, the randomness of the game happens. So if you're here at Whirlwind, or whatever that's called, Whirl... The Windmill. Windmill. <laughs> whirlwind. <laughs> if, you're at, if you're at the Whirlwind Windmill, then you would just pull a card from it. If you want to encounter that space, and you would pull a card, and then you would read the text that's on that card. This could be good stuff. It could be bad stuff. It could be people that you're going to be going uh, that could help you. It could be items that you could find or it could hurt you. Just all kinds of things that can happen in that location. And then that's it. So there's a number of other actions that you can do. Encounter space, collect an uh, investigation token that's there. Um, you can heal a wound. You can look at uh, secrets, which is another aspect to the game. So you're trying to figure out if these people that are in the game are evil or if they're good. And so each one of these um, elders that are in the game have two cards, right? And so is that how that works? And that you have them all lined out. And then each one could be given a secret. So they'll have a secret underneath them. Like so. That's what it was, yeah. Which, because you can take them to uh, to go defeat the villain with you, mm -hmm. but it, when you take them, mm -hmm. they reveal their secret, and um, some of them might just have little secrets. Some of them might actually have that betray you, and they're actually helping the the, the villain out. Um, so you don't really want to go in there w without knowing what's. Um, what they're doing so yeah and so a lot of the villains you have to have someone with you right so it's it, you want to have somebody but you got to have the right person with you so you want to know if they're going to be good or bad and that's a game so you're just taking your turn moving around the board exploring these uh locations you're trying to find the bad guy and then you basically all converge on one location and try to take them out and so there's combat in the game so you're going to be rolling dice and you're going to be able to change the dice and do different things based off the items or the people that are with you different things like that and then it's just rolling dice and seeing if you win so now, i remember when we play we so we play we always play as co-op there's two ways to play you can play as co-op or individually um, I prefer the co-op personally. I just think it's, it's just a better way to play the game. But uh, those, you do have those uh, possibilities also in the game. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah, I would definitely suggest uh, playing this with less than the maximum eight players. Yeah. Because that game is forever, um, and a lot of people get bored. You know, as the turns go around to each person's, you know, because. It when could take a while, yeah. Turn, you know, they're actually encountering this, and everybody wants to read out the flavor text and stuff like that, and actually get into the characters of the, of the game. So eight people, eight people, <laughs> and it takes wow. a while to get and around. When we played the last. It was was it all eight? Do we have all eight? Or we I think we had like six or something. Was it eight? It might have been because it was at Rock. It was a lot. So. It was a lot of people. So I mean. I would agree with that. I mean, I would think like four people is probably where you'd want to play this one. Um, I think that's a good amount. I mean, the, the game itself, the flavor is pretty cool. I mean, I love the vamp. The so you can have vampire, it does scale werewolf, too. scarecrows. So it, the game actually scales for how many people you have, sure. mm -hmm. and then what play type you're doing. So, um, so that way you don't have to worry about like, well, four people, we won't have enough manpower to kill the villain or something. Exactly. You don't have to worry about it. It all changes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so do we want to talk about uh, good and bad in the game? What did you think about it? Um, I didn't like the complexity of the rules, but then it being a simple game was nice. Um, mm -hmm. After you get through it, when you actually play around, you kind of get the feel for it. Um, but it was still a lot of looking up this rule, looking up that rule. But I did love the flavor of the game. You know, they they really they really sell the cheap horror uh, movie uh, feel for it. Yeah. And, and you're going through and you feel like you're playing through one of those period one of those movies. horror movies. So <laughs> it's pretty cool. Yeah, for me, it kind of it kind of missed for me, and I guess we'll get to that later. But I don't know. Like the the great thing about these types of games, when all of the flavor comes through the cards, is the the replayability is there because every time you encounter a location, you really have no idea what you're going to encounter. The problem with that is you could have somebody walking away just with a dud game, you know, where they could if every time they're drawing this random card, they could be the guy that gets hit by every single thing. And my luck, that was me. You, you know, got punished. <laughs> I mean, last game. <laughs> and so like the game felt like. It it went on forever, and so every time I drew a card, it wouldn't do it wouldn't do me any good. I had bad dice roll, so I couldn't go anywhere. So I remember you guys were playing the whole game, and I contributed nothing. <laughs> you know, like I did, I did nothing. So that I mean that you got to understand that maybe that could happen to you. And I'm not blaming the game per se on that. It was just bad luck and how it worked for me. But that's a possibility when you when you work out a game that's kind of worked like this. You know, yeah. it takes it takes the player's strategy out 
out because then you're at the mercy of the cards and the dice, you know, that kind of thing. So and I would agree. I mean, I think with this game itself, the best thing about it is, and it's really what Flying Frog does with most of its games, like uh, Fortune and Glory and so mm -hmm. on. It pulls you really into the game. You can you really feel like you're kind of there and the whole thing. And I just love the characters that they have playing. You know, and that we get to see them at Gen Con and that type of thing. Have them sign our <laughs> sign our cool. cards if we want. <laughs> but uh, I do like that they go an extra mile and they do a lot of stuff. They do tend to pay a little bit more I think, for these games, but they they go the extra mile themselves with the game itself. Mm -hmm. So if you're in, you know if this type of thing, if you're interested in. I mean, I think, I think it really hit, it would hit a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. All right. At the end of our reviews, we like to do a one-die rating. Do we think that you should buy it, play it, or hate it? Buy it means go out, add this to your collection. White means you wouldn't buy it, but you definitely play it. And then red means don't buy it and don't play it because you hate it. So. And reveal your choice. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Two white and a red. So tell us why you gave it a white. Uh, like you said, some people got punished um, during the game. Uh, uh, the game doesn't move very fast. It is nice for flavor, so I would play it mm -hmm. um, and everything. But it's not my style of game for that, um, you know, that uh, that just hide and seek uh, kind of thing. I would prefer to play, you know, Pathfinder, mm -hmm. the card game, um, instead. But right. I gave this one a red. Uh, it just didn't work for me. And it could be, like I said before, that I just got, you know, like Tim said, punished by the game and had bad uh, dice rolls and bad card pulls. But it just didn't really work for me. It felt like it drug on for a long time. Um, even the flavor and stuff that happened in the game, I just felt like I couldn't get anywhere. And so I felt like I was out of control. So when it drug on, I felt like, well, what's the point? You know, and so I just remember I was totally out of this game. So <laughs> anyways, that, that's a red for me. Uh, for me, I gave it a white. Um, that was a hard choice. I mean, I was between green and white. Um, my cousin's the one that got us the game, and uh, George <laughs> is the greatest cousin in the world. But anyway, um, George is a great you. guy. <laughs> we love you, George. <laughs> and the, I mean, the game, would I go out and buy it? Uh, you know, I'm so much into so many other games that I probably would never have bought the game. Uh, will I play it again? Yeah, I'll play it again. I enjoy it. So I figure it fits the white well. Uh, you know, I am just a big fan of the Flying Frog games. I think they just do a great job, and uh, mm -hmm. just hope to see more games coming out like this. And and the and if you look at disadvantages of the game, I would say that it does carry on real long. <laughs> it just carries on. <laughs> yeah, it can carry on a little long. But uh, other than that. Uh, yeah, I would say I'm, I'm a white, but tending to green. Yeah, and I totally agree, like, about frying fl fly, <laughs> frying <laughs> We're going to fry the frog. <laughs> frying the frog. Flying frog, I totally agree, because what they do well is a storytelling type thing, because I love Last Night on Earth, Fortune and Glory, like, those games, man, I, I just love them, so, you know. Anyway, so. All right, that's our review of A Touch of Evil. Thanks for watching The Board Game Closet. Check us out on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We're all over. And as always, support your local hobby shop. <laughs> <laughs> Bye-bye. He shot it out there.